All right. Thank you, Kyle. So I'll kick us off today and we're going to be going over different ways to pay for nursing home care and things that you need to be aware of as you navigate through the second half of life for the for those of you that are privileged enough to have made it that far. So what we're going to go over today is ways to take the maze of long term care planning and estate planning and make sure that you're equipped with the powers and the knowledge to be able to plan for what's to come, knowing that we all don't have a crystal ball. So who, who's this relevant to? This particular seminar is for you if you're among the most people, really for anybody who has more than $8,000 of total assets in your name, but would not be comfortable writing a check of over $12,000 per month to a nursing home, then this is for you. That middle ground is, is, is who we're here to protect. And, um, and anybody who's making sure that, well, that's worried about that cost, but also wants to plan ahead to make sure that um, that there is a plan in place that, that can be enacted in such a point that you're not able to manage your own affairs. So we do this for the peace of mind of knowing that there is something in place. So we don't have a crystal ball or a magic wand that you could wave to say, I know exactly what's going to happen and I know exactly how this is going to go because... Um, well, no, nobody has that kind of power, but even if you did have that magic ball, would you really want to look into it? And, and you know, I, I can make a perfect plan if I know when somebody's going to get sick, what they're going to get sick of, and when somebody's going to die. But we don't want to know those things. So what we so what we need to do is make sure that we have a plan that provides the flexibility for your families to be able to react to whatever's going to happen and protects your spouse and your beneficiaries to make sure that um your second half of life can be planned to the extent that um, it can be given all the uncertainties that happen with aging. So let's let's hear from a, uh, a client testimonial here. This is Patricia from Port Matilda, most likely I, I, I assume in our state college office. And she, she was glad that she made the call to reach out to us. Um, and, and she noticed quickly that we have a very uh, knowledgeable staff, and she was able to be financially prepared for the future. So there's a roadmap that she can follow, and as she navigates her second half of life, she has the peace of mind of knowing that while we can't know exactly what's going to happen to her, there is a plan and there are people in place that will be able to take the ball from there. So, all right, well, let's, it, it will introduce our speakers. So I guess I, I started this off, so I'll go first. Again, as Kyle mentioned, my name is Landon Hodges. I'm one of the partners here at the firm. Um, if you pick up any accent as I'm talking, I'm originally from Mount Airy, North Carolina, small town just north of um, Winston-Salem. But for those of you who are aware of the Andy Griffith Show, it's known as Mayberry. So uh, if you find a similar accent there, that's exactly what it is. I did all of my schooling down there, first at Wake Forest University, then went on to Elon University School of Law, moved up here in 2017, first as an intern with a specialty in our wealth protection planning. But since then, I've, I've broadened that to to be able to work in anything that the firm does from wealth protection to long-term care, special needs planning, um, state administration. And I also am, am the fortunate one or unfortunate one, depending on the situation that goes to court and does litigation stuff. Um, I've been recognized as, the, as a rising star with super lawyers. Unfortunately, that does not come with a cape. I guess you have to go more than rising star to get the cape, but for the past about three years, and I've been in my role as a partner since we uh, took over the Y Lucing office and started managing that in 2021. Oh, and of course, most importantly, I was six months ago, I became a father. So I'm uh, not too not too low on sleep yet. So life's not got me down. <laughs> All right, Tammy. All right, thank you, Landon. Uh, my name is Tammy Zilski. I'm a long-term care planner in our Williamsport office. Um, we have two certified Medicaid planners um, in our law firms, and I'm one of them. That allows us to be knowledgeable about all the Medicaid rules and the ever-changing uh, regulations that they throw out on us so that we can help our clients. Um, I'm also a certified dementia practitioner. Um, I hold an insurance license um, really just to make sure that we're knowledgeable about insurance products for the law firm, but we do not sell insurance here. I've been with the law firm for a little more than 16 years. And just to give you a little background, prior to my work here, I was a hospice social worker and I worked as a home and community-based uh, care manager. 
Uh, I started my career out as a candy striper at the Williamsport Hospital. Many of you are probably familiar with the, the candy stripers. And, and that is where I um, fell in love with helping people. So that really just kind of triggered the, the goal of going to school for social work. Um, and my work here at the law firm is um, <clears throat> wonderful because uh, I have very strong advocacy skills for our clients. But when I have an attorney behind that in the law, um, it really just makes uh, the work that I do much more impactful. Like many of you, um, I've experienced uh, having a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. You'll see here I have a picture of my grandmother and uh, my mom and her uh, and our grand and the grandchildren. Um, this was when my grandmother was in very late stage Alzheimer's. And so she journeyed through this disease for more than 10 years. She was cared for by her spouse at home. I got to see how that really uh, impacted his health negatively. Uh, she went and lived with my mom for a very short period of time and then moved on to a nursing home uh, in the Alzheimer's unit, uh, was there for, for six years. And so, you know, not only do I help people navigate the process of long-term care, but I have also experienced it. So that really does help me to have empathy to know what, what people are doing. So we're going to hear from another one of our clients. Um, after my husband went into a nursing home, I went to another law firm in the area to see what could be done about paying for his care. They said there was nothing that could, they could do for me and that I'd have to spend down my money for him to then be eligible to receive Medicaid. I was very concerned and felt they just left me on my own. I later was told to call this firm. I figured why not? Because at this point I had nothing to lose. After explaining my situation, I was told to come in right away because I required immediate attention. What they did for me was unreal, especially after being told I was in a hopeless situation by that other firm. They took action to protect our assets and get my husband's nursing home bills taken care of into the future. Everyone was so wonderful. I had taken my daughter with me and when we were told the bills were going to be paid, she cried because she knew what the other lawyer had previously said. I can't say enough about the kind of attention to detail. And so we wanted to just show you this because this is what we hear from all of our clients that we help with the Medicaid planning process, um, that they didn't realize that there were options to protect their assets um, and it is so important to come to a knowledgeable elder law firm um, because we know all of the uh, things that can be done to help you protect your assets. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Landon again. Yep, and so, uh, so let's get into it. So we're gonna go over what we need to do to make sure that you and your loved ones are taken care of in the second half of life. And so as you see in that last testimonial, not all information and not all legal services are created equal. So we want to make sure that you get the right information and good and quality and quality service that can um, lead to better outcomes and reduce the uncertainty of aging. So let's dive right in. So option number one is making sure that you have good legal documents. The most important legal document that you can have in your estate planning portfolio is your powers of attorney. And so what is a power of attorney? At its most simple form, it's a written document where one person, so that's you that's signing it, authorizes another person to act on their behalf. So this could be a child, a friend, any trusted individual. There is a common misconception that a spouse has the authority to act on your behalf, but that's not necessarily true. For healthcare, especially if you know your doctor, there might be some leeway there, but for finances outside of joint accounts, there is no expectation or there is no assumption that a spouse can act on your behalf. So think of life insurance policies, IRAs, separate bank accounts, vehicles, anything that's in a person's name alone can only be accessed by that person or a power of attorney. And if a person does not have a power of attorney, if you don't plan ahead to choose who would step into this role, then... Um, 
The only other alternative is to go through a, what's known as a guardianship, which is a court process where the court declares a person incapacitated if they're not able to make their own decisions and appoints a guardian on their behalf. It's being a court process, as soon as you file it, it enters courtroom time, which does not move quickly. It takes about three months to do this. And if you wait until a person's in a nursing home before you try to find a decision maker, if it takes me three months to get the power to enact one of Tammy's plans, average cost of nursing home care is about $12,800 a month. Times that by three, you're $38,000 in the hole before we can get started. So getting good documents in place is how you prevent that and allow yourself to plan ahead. So when I say powers of attorney, again, generally, we're just saying who has the power to make decisions. Within that umbrella, it's broken up. We break these up into four different documents. They, there can be different people on each of them, or you can have the same person on all of them, but they all do different things and are enacted at different times. So there's one that handles finances, one that handles health care, one for mental health, and a living will, which I'll discuss in a moment for end-of-life decisions. The financial one, as you would expect, handles the, the easy stuff. So who can manage your bank accounts, deal with your real estate, defend in litigation or uh, on your behalf. But a good one will also make sure that a person can enact a plan to protect your assets, which would be the power to make gifts or the power to create a trust. But now you can't use general language in these documents. You have to be specific about the powers. So, for example, if it just says the power to make gifts, which I will say most law firms do, because why elder law? Well, why why would you go to a specialist to do this? Because a lot of people make them sound like they're simple documents. Well, even within licensed attorneys, you don't know what you don't know. So if you have a general form that has been passed down in your firm for generations and it, it works legally, that's fine. You don't know why the word gift is not enough. And if it doesn't say unlimited gifts, well, you are limited. And if you have to make large gifts, like to protect real estate, for example, you don't have that power. And here we are going to court for a guardianship. So most financial power of attorneys do not have the power to make unlimited gifts, create irrevocable trust, create special needs trust, or deal with digital assets. And so it's good to plan ahead and know that your documents have these in place because you don't want to find out when it's too late to update them. So I mentioned the need to be um, specific in these documents. So there was a, a law change in July 2014. So and it was effective uh, in the beginning of 2015. So if you are on this call and you have things in place, if your power of attorney is older than 2015, it's probably time to have it looked at. Because under this law change, everything must be spelled out. So if you've seen documents from our firm, they're not they're they're not brief, um, which is which is fine. We don't do that on purpose just to make you read a lot. Um, we do that because we're not allowed to be specific, and we want your agents to be empowered to take over your estate if they really have to. So there should be a paragraph for every single power that the agent has, and as long as you trust that person, which you should if you're going to name them. They should be very powerful because this is the person that's going to step into your shoes if you ever find yourself unable to manage your own affairs. <clears throat> All right, so that's the financial. On the other side of things, you've got your general health care power of attorney. This one is much smaller because this one is more or less general, but you name a person who's going to be able to make your health care decisions. Now, of course, you're still in control for as long as you're able to be, but if you're unconscious or incapacitated, you need to, the doctor needs to have a point of contact. Who can consent to surgery, choose where you receive medical treatment, and of course, HIPAA, the medical privacy law, who can review your medical records? Because it's kind of hard to make decisions if you're not allowed to view records. So that's an important one to have. And then similarly, there's one for mental health. Now, this one's relatively new, especially on the timeline of laws. Laws have been around forever. This particular document's only been around in Pennsylvania since about 2013, but it works similarly. Um, you appoint a person that would be able to act on your behalf for your mental health care. Um, and it also includes treatments that would not be included in the health care power of attorney because mental health is an ever-changing area of medicine. So things like a trial study or an experimental drug may be in your best interest if you were suffering from a mental health condition. 
and making sure that your agent has all the powers that they need includes mental health care as well. One thing that makes this one different, I don't like this law, but it it is the law, so I need to tell you about it. A mental health power of attorney expires every two years. Um, and so at our office, we keep a spreadsheet to remind you about that. But unfortunately, that is the law as of right now. If it ever changes, we will stop doing that. But for right now, that's the, that's the lay of the land. Um, and then the last one, I do consider this a power of attorney because it is still naming somebody to act on your behalf while you're alive. But there is also a living will. And this deals with only end of life decisions. <clears throat> and it, and we keep this separate from the healthcare power of attorney because of the powers of attorney, this is the only document that states what your wishes are as opposed to just naming who would carry out your wishes. So it comes into play if you're in a terminal condition or a state of permanent unconsciousness, like a coma or a vegetative state. And most importantly, there is no realistic hope of significant recovery. So basically you're at the end of the line with no hope of recovery. And it answers the question of, if you find yourself in that situation, what treatment would you want? Or most importantly, well, what I see most commonly with my clients, what treatments would you not want in that situation? So for example, you know, would you want pain relieving drugs or what's known, especially in, in hospice realms as comfort measures? Um, but then as far as procedures, would you want a ventilator, a feeding tube, CPR, surgery? to keep you alive again, remembering that this document's only coming into play if there's no hope of recovery. Um, I, this is always up to you as, as far as what you feel about these situations. But most commonly, my clients tell me that if there's no hope of recovery, keep me comfortable and let me go. Well, that's, and then that's certainly common to see, but that needs to be in writing because again, in this situation, you're not able to make your own decisions. So make putting this in writing while you are is very important for future planning. All right, so that's number one. Number two, well, it goes with the theme of having good legal documents in place, but wills and trusts. And most people know what a will is. There's a lot of misconceptions about a trust. I'm going to try to clear some of that up today because the word trust is, is as broad as the word car. You tell me you're buying a car. That's great. I have no clue what kind you're buying. Are you buying a Ferrari or are you buying a minivan? They're both cars. Um, trusts are the same way. Between the cover page and the signature page, only what's in the middle matters, and, and I don't know till I see it. But to differentiate between these two things, uh, the powers of attorney only matter while you're alive. And they determine who makes decisions for you while you are alive. As soon as you die, they're no longer good. Then your will comes out. Um, and describes what, what you would want to happen there. Trusts do both. Trusts have what I describe as two, two sections. How is it administered while you're alive? And then what happens to it when you die? Sometimes it's straightforward like a will. Sometimes it survives you. It's really up to the client. I, I, I love using trust as a tool because there's a lot of things you can do with them and they're extremely customizable. So if you can describe it, I can translate it to legalese and make it work for you. Um, but let's start with the will. So we talked about powers of attorney while you're alive, who makes decisions. A okay. will is important because as soon as you die, you, you are empowered to be able to put in writing what happens to your stuff and who's in charge of doing it. So you will, of course, write who gets what. Um, and you can be as specific or general as you want to there. So it could be as easily as easy as equally among my children. And then if one of my children dies before me, it goes to their children. That's pretty common, pretty simple, but it doesn't have to be. I've, heck, I've done 15 page wills with people getting very specific. It's up to you. It's all, this is all personal. Nothing's cookie cutter in our office. It's all specific to your situation. But you also need to designate in your will, who is your executor or personal representative. We use the term executor. If you ever see personal representative, it means the exact same thing. It's who's doing the work. You know, you die, you own a lifetime worth of assets. Who's going to get that to your heirs? Your executor. You have the power to name this. And then for those of you who might have minor children, you can name, well, if, if you have somebody under 18, there needs to be a guardian. Again, all of this is about power and empowering you know, what you want. So you can say who it is. 
A will needs to be signed in front of two witnesses and a notary to be self-proving, meaning you don't have to drag witnesses into court to say, oh, yeah, I saw them see, sign it. Um, and then a good will is going to have what's known as a bypass clause, um, a clause that would say that if typically a person's a married person's will would say, if I die first, everything goes to my spouse. But what happens if that spouse is in really poor health or in a nursing home? Um, in order to protect some assets, we don't want it going all to them. So the I love you will is everything goes to my spouse. The I love you, but will is I love you, but we're going to lose all of our assets if this goes into your name. So we're going to go ahead and protect the children there. Now, even if we bypass the spouse, I will note that legally you can legally you can't disinherit your spouse. Um, they always have the power to force at least one third of your estate. So that's not protected. But in a bypass clause, you can at least protect two thirds of your estate, even if your spouse is in very poor health when you pass away. All right. Now, anytime I talk about wills, I would be remiss to not talk about will substitutes. So the will is does not cover everything that's in your estate. Um, the will only covers what's known as probate assets. So probate assets are assets that are in your name alone with no joint owner, with no beneficiary designation. But there are assets that can that can pass non-probate, and that's assets that are in trust, joint assets with right of survivorship, and assets with a beneficiary designation. So a lot of you probably have retirement plans or life insurance policies or uh, maybe brokerage accounts with a, with a POD or transfer on death designation. Well, regardless of what your will says, those assets are going to pass to that beneficiary. So let's say you, when you open your retirement plan, you put your three children on there. And since then, one of them needs to come out of the plan. I'm not going to ask why. This is your plan. Sometimes children need to be cut out. I, I, I'm, I'm here for that. But OK, so I update your will for you. If you don't update that life insurance policy or that IRA, then it's going three ways. So anytime you change the distribution scheme of your estate plan, check your will and check joint owners on your accounts and your beneficiary designations, because this can be very important. <clears throat> All right. And um, oh, yep, and so it's good to look at those every once in a while because I our firm does a comprehensive approach, so we're going to look at it all. But if you go to to uh, um, a less specialized law firm and tell them, you know, if they're there to just take orders from you, you say, I want a will or I want to update my will. They say, OK, you hit the print button. Here it is. No consultation. No look at it. You're done. Well, you got what you asked for. You got a will, but they didn't take a look at your situation and apply any expertise to it. Um. And so, so, so yeah, so the will covers, like I said, everything that's in your name. And I, but I dabble in the word trust earlier. So exactly what is that? So a trust is an entity separate from you, um, governed by a written document. Basically, it's an entity that can hold property out of your name under rules that you set. You get to choose who the trustee is, meaning who manages assets that are in this trust. And you get to set the beneficiaries. So who's the trust for? Who does it go to when you die? Who can access it while you're alive? Um, and there's, and I said earlier, there's the, the word trust is as broad as the word car. I, I probably have done 10 to 15 different types of trusts. So when somebody says they have one, it doesn't tell me anything. But there's two large umbrellas within trust law that need to be you need to be aware of. One is revocable trust sometimes called a living trust. And the other one is a word that my accent, people pronounce this differently, but an irrevocable trust or irrevocable. I, I have trouble saying that, but irrevocable. Um, so revocable trust, it, it's exactly the way you can. it sounds. You can do anything to it. You can change any word of it, or you can say, I don't like this anymore. I revoke it and give everything back to me. That avoids probate still, but it provides no long-term care or asset protection whatsoever, because if you're allowed to reach in there and take whatever you want, then a nursing home is allowed to make you go in there and pay your bill out of it. 
On the other hand, an irrevocable trust is the opposite. Once it's set up, you can't just change your mind and say, I, I want to pull everything out of here, which is where you get protection. So in order to get any sort of protection, whether that's from long-term care or from taxes, you do have to give up some power, some control, and some access. Because if you have it all, it's all it's all at risk. Um, and so irrevocable trust allows you to choose what you protect. So just because you set one up does not mean that everything goes in there. Once it's set up, the next question is, what do you want to put in here? What do you want to protect? And now the way we set our trust, our irrevocable trust up, is that you can still keep control of the asset. So you're not completely giving it away. You're putting it into a trust that you can be the trustee of. You can manage this. But, and you can, so by managing, I mean, you can sell real estate, you can buy stocks, you can sell stocks, you can choose what happens to the assets. The one thing you cannot do while, get, while getting the protection that we want you to have is you cannot pull principal out of the trust, meaning the value of whatever you put in there. Um, and so, for example, in real estate, if you put a house in there, it's protected subject to, the, to a five-year look-back period that Tammy's going to discuss in a little while. Um, you're As the trustee, you're allowed to sell that house and downsize if you want. But the money from that sale is principal. So if you sell a house for $200,000, the trust now owns $200,000. Now that money is protected and you can use it to buy a new house, but you can't say I'm going to pull out $50,000 and go on a river cruise in Europe because you're protecting that money. So it's money that you want to set aside to ensure that it will be inherited by your children down the road. And all right, so a little recap there. So what do we do at this point? Review if you've got existing documents in place, especially if it's been over, say, seven to 10 years, it's good to dust the old thing off, have a look at it. Make sure you've got good legal documents in place to avoid your family from, from getting into a bad situation if um, you were to find yourself not able to manage your affairs and have not planned ahead. And, and Tammy, if you want to pick up from here and tell them about John and Denise here. Okay, so we have another client testimonial saying, thank you so very much for the exceptional service. The financial investment we made in your firm is suitable. Uh, for we now have peace of mind in regards to our estate planning. And we I hear that every day. Yesterday I had appointment after appointment and people were just so happy that they got their estate planning done. So now their, their children don't have to worry about who's going to make decisions for them if they're in the hospital, or who's going to pay their bills. So it's so very important. So thank you, Landon, for going over that. So number three, you need to know what care options are available and how to pay for care. So there are different types of care. Um, just meeting with somebody yesterday whose uh, parent is in assisted living and she thought it was a nursing home. So um, there are different levels of care. So most of you know about nursing home care. Nursing home care is, is really um, reserved for people who need a lot of care, either physically or mentally. But in addition to that, there are personal care homes, also known as assisted living care. Assisted living care is really um, reserved for individuals who are somewhat independent, but need some oversight in their, their daily care, whether that be medication management, meal preparation, assistance with personal care, um, but they're not bed bound. They don't need total care. A lot of assisted living facilities are now offering tiered care. So it is very confusing. People think that an assisted living that offers multiple levels of care is uh, equivalent to a nursing home, but be aware that they do not have the same staffing requirements by the Department of Health, um, and they don't provide the same level of care. But it is really great that these assisted living facilities are offering these different levels of care because people were typically forced to go to nursing homes when really they didn't need to be there. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the pay differences on those types of facilities. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as I go into the next slide. But before I go into that, the other type of care you can get is in-home care. 
So you can hire caregivers to come into your home. These are typically not nurses. It would just be non-skilled caregivers who are going to come in and help you with bathing, dressing, meal preparation, shopping, errands, things like that. And depending on where you live, there may be an abundance of home care agencies available to you. Um, if you live in very rural areas, there may be very few. So um, you just really have to be aware of what's available in your area. Um, we're lucky at our office, we have um, what we call care coordinators and their job is to really help our clients navigate these services. What, what can they get to stay at home? Where could they go if they need assisted living or nursing home care? In addition to that, that's not on this slide that I just want to bring up is um, some areas have what's called life programs. And it's a comprehensive medical program where you um, go to an adult day program during the day, but you come home at night. Um, so that is also available in certain areas. The next thing you really need to know is, well, how do I pay for care? Uh, there's private pay. So you, obviously you can use your own money to pay for care. If you don't need a lot of care, that might be sustainable. But if you need nursing home care, it's upwards to $175,000 a year. So you're gonna need to know what benefits are out there to help you pay for care. Um, we also look at veterans benefits. So veterans benefits are available for, um, for service or non-service connected disability benefits. Um, and if you serve during a qualifying war period, you're over 65 years old or disabled, um, you can qualify or your spouse, or if you're widowed, could qualify for a monthly pension and that will help pay for in-home care, assisted living or nursing home care. Now, I usually reserve that for in-home care or assisted living care because the maximum amount is a little over $3,000 you can get per month. And again, if we're looking at a twelve dollars or $13,000 monthly nursing home bill, obviously that's not sufficient. The other way to pay for care is long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance is something you need to get in advance of the crisis. So you can't uh, be sick and get long-term care insurance. Um, you really have to start the application process for that probably in your 50s, maybe early 60s, but not have a medical diagnosis that's going to make the insurance company deny your application. So that is something that our law firm does not sell, but we can get you in contact with um, licensed agents who do sell that. And I strongly encourage everybody who can afford it to consider long-term care insurance because really it opens up your options on where you live and what type of care that you can receive. Medicare is another way to pay for care, but it's very short term. So um, there are Medicare Advantage plans that take the place of your Medicare. So I just want people to be aware that Medicare will pay for up to 100 days in a skilled nursing facility after a three-day qualifying hospital stay. But if you have gotten into a Medicare Advantage plan, you are giving up your Medicare rights. And so you, um, you, you may not receive 100 days. It all depends on the plan that you sign up for. So if you are considering uh, when open enrollment comes up here in October through December and looking at a, a less expensive Medicare supplement plan to supplement your Medicare and you're thinking about an Advantage plan, just make sure you talk to your agent about all of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of what they will pay for. But regardless, Medicare was not set up to pay for long-term care. So if you need care beyond your therapy, Medicare is not going to pay for that. And that's when it goes back to the private pay. The final way to pay for care is Medicaid. Um, and in order to be eligible for Medicaid, you have to be meet the financial criteria. Um, this is a much more complex conversation to have on a, a, in a seminar. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about this, but really, Without the help of an elder law attorney, um, getting Medicaid is very difficult. They, I've been doing Medicaid applications for um, 
close to 17 years now. And I would say in the last four or five years, they've gotten more and more challenging. Um, so anybody who needs nursing home care, I just really strongly recommend that you try not to do this on your own, get to an elder law firm so that we can maximize what's protected and get you those benefits you're entitled to. But just to kind of go back, when I was talking about facility care, assisted living care is always private pay. So if you are looking at that type of level of care, just be aware you could get, you know, use your own money private pay, you could use your veterans benefits, you could use long-term care insurance. Medicare and Medicaid will not pay for the assisted living facilities. So when you are looking at a facility for you or a loved one, you need to make sure you understand how, um, how individuals pay for that type of care. And again, we're here to help you navigate through that process. So number four is asset protection options. So what is long-term care planning? So Landon talked a little bit about trust and the importance of trust. And what you need to understand is if you do not have a plan in place, the state has a plan for you. And that plan is that you will spend every dollar you have until you qualify for public benefits if you meet the criteria for those public Medicaid benefits. So what we do here, um, and I kind of to back up, years ago, people came to elder law attorneys because they were in crisis. And you know, we did our very best at this firm you know, years ago to try to help people get the benefits that they needed to pay for care. And I would say the bulk of our um, services right now, in addition to crisis planning, is pre-planning. And that's the work that, that Landon does with clients. People that don't want to be in a crisis, they want to have a good plan in place so that if they go to a nursing home, they have the peace of mind the nursing home or the state of Pennsylvania cannot take their home. They cannot take their assets. Uh, they cannot take uh, their income. So having a good plan in place is really what will allow you to have that assurance that those assets that you worked really hard for are protected. How do you protect these assets? So like Landon said, every client's different. We, um, we customize our plan based on our clients, what their needs are, what their family um, looks like. You know, do they have children with disabilities? Um, is their spouse going to need care at home or an assisted living? Uh, so there's all sorts of uh, plans that, that we can look at based on whatever your needs are. So it's really kind of like putting a puzzle together, which is kind of um, fun for us. We're able to look at your situation and then we put together all the appropriate legal documents and long-term care planning so that we're helping you meet those goals that you have. So one of the things that people ask us every day is, can I just give my property to my kids or give my money to my kids and protect it? Um, you can do that, but there are a lot of risks with that. Um, you'll see here, we have the four Ds. The, the biggest risk is, if you're, you give your property to your child and they pass away before you, their death becomes subject to, um, you know, your property is subject to their death. So you could lose your property um, to the beneficiaries of their estate. Um, if they became disabled themselves and went into a nursing home, you could lose your property to their disability. If they had debt, they got in a car accident, no fault of their own, somebody sued them beyond the insurance, your property could be subject to their um, debt. Um, and so there are just a number of, of things to consider when we're looking at um, transferring to children. And most of the time we recommend the trust because it's, those assets are shielded from the beneficiary's creditors. The other thing to kind of keep in mind is there is a five year look back for Medicaid. So if you came into our office today and said, I wanna put my property in a trust, but my spouse is gonna need nursing home care very soon, we're gonna have a different plan for you because of the five year look back. 
doesn't mean we can't help you. We have other strategies um, that will not jeopardize your benefits within five years. So that five-year look back is very important. And then I know a lot of seminar attendees have uh, questions about the $500 gifting limit. So Medicaid, when you apply for benefits, they are gonna pull in all of your finances in the last five years. And they will look through your bank accounts. And if you have made gifts in excess of 500 in a calendar month, so that for example means the month of September, um, you gave away $700 they will deny your application for benefits for a period of time. In that situation, it's two days. So it's very important that if you think you're going to need long-term care, that you really make sure you do not give away assets in excess of 500 in a calendar month. So the next thing that we'll be talking about is dementia care planning. So this is something that our office is very passionate about because again, we have a lot of our staff have experienced family members with dementia, but we've also served a lot of um, clients at our law firm that have had dementia or Alzheimer's or a variety of different types of um, uh, cognitive declines. And so we really wanna make sure that we're meeting the needs of those clients. Um, so the things that we consider when we're meeting with a dementia client is, do they have good legal planning documents? And if they don't, we want to get those right away before they lose the ability to, to put those in place. Um, we're also looking at, you know, what are the needs going to be long, long term? Who's going to care for them if their primary caregiver can't care for them? Um, and just a variety of different things that, that we work on uh, for, for those clients. So some action steps to remember are um, to make sure that you have good uh, medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney, and good legal planning in place. So I'm going to turn it over to Landon. All right. Yep. And thank you, Tammy. But just like I mentioned earlier, so a good plan is going to be one that is specific to you. There's I, there's no way I can do a, a in, in anybody who's met with me in, in the office uh, knows that I'm not. I'm not brief. <laughs> I'm pretty long-winded, but I can't just take a 10-minute phone call and then hit print on my computer and have a plan for you. It needs to be specific to you. And if you have other professionals, I love to work with clients, financial advisors, and accountants, because that way, between the three of us, we have a full picture of your situation. And if we're all on the same page, that's just more assurance that you have a good plan that's going to work in your situation. So Tammy mentioned that uh, dementia planning is central to what we do. We are a dementia-friendly law firm. So what is that? Well, it's more than just spitting out legal documents. Again, we're not a paper factory. We're not a, a, a firm that's just going to, to have the same cookie-cutter approach to every client. We want to look at your entire situation and reach out into the community to see what, at, to see what um, sort of resources are out there. So what we do is, is, a, is about planning, but it's also about empowering. We want to empower you to make sure that your plan works for you and that you know what's out there so that whatever the second half of life throws at you, you're going to be equipped to handle. And uh, it, as part of that, so um, Tammy mentioned that some of, some of our coworkers are our care coordinators. And so we do um, support groups for caregivers or people that are going people that are going through this journey themselves or children who are working with parents that are going through this journey. Um, you see some dates on here. We got virtual meetings on Zoom. Um, our state college office does some in person at the fourth Tuesday of each month. Williams, Williamsport does third Tuesday of each, each month at our resource center on Washington Boulevard. And it's not on here. We must have ran out of room. But our it, for those of you in the northern tier, our Y losing office hosts one at our, well, actually at our Y Sox office. I believe that's the second Tuesday of every month as well. Um, we have plenty of resources. So if you wanted more information, um, you can always schedule a consultation to sit down with me or Tammy or another one of our uh, coworkers to talk about your situation. But if you wanted to look into it more, we've got a number of resources and books. You see here that uh, our founding partner, Julie Steinbacher, has written it at, at 
at least two, if not three books um, that are great for caregivers or people that are going through this, this, um, this journey themselves. So feel free to reach out if you'd like some more information. We're glad to get that to you. And this slide, there's a lot going on here, but we, I keep talking about the journey. So as a dementia-focused law firm, there's a lot of steps involved here. And as you can see on here, elder care attorney visit is several of these steps. So you're not alone in this journey, but know that, that um, it's normal to be overwhelmed by the process. So it's good to have um, <clears throat> a knowledgeable professionals in place that can assist you on both the financial, medical, and um, social side of all of this. All right, so what do you do? Well, you put a plan in place. And what does that plan look like? So to kind of recap, we've gone over three different levels of planning. Tammy mentioned pre-planning, which is where everybody starts. It starts with the wills, starts with the powers of attorney, getting the documents and the infrastructure in place to be able to react if something happens to you, or setting aside assets to come up with a gifting strategy to make sure that if there is a crisis, you're more prepared and you already have assets saved. That's step one. Step two is crisis planning. We Thankfully, our industry no longer waits for the crisis, but we are still equipped to do it. And Tammy is at the forefront of that with all of her, her wealth of Medicaid knowledge, um, where if you've done some pre-planning, the amount that has to be spent in crisis is much less. But even if somebody skips step one and you have that, um, that, that crisis, there's still a lot that can be done. So it's not too late until potentially somebody passes away, which step three of all planning is estate administration. After somebody passes away, there's a lot of work to be done. Those who have worked with our office before they pass are already going to be equipped to, to know what that roadmap looks like. But even those who haven't, our office is equipped to walk you through that process and allow you to continue to be with your family, to grieve together. We'll take all the business stuff. So a plan in place can walk you through each of those. Step one is always great. Step two, some people need it, some people don't. You don't know what's going to happen in the second half of life, but no one escapes step three. So making sure that you're equipped when you get there is key. All right. And so, um, so remember, planning ahead is essential. It's all about empowering and it's all about the peace of mind. Making sure that your family is taken care of and that you don't spend any more than you have to on long-term care. Because let's be real, 12000 bucks is a lot of money to spend every month. So how do we make that happen? Well, step one, give us a call. Schedule a uh, consultation at any of our offices. Um, I, I think me and Tammy are both sitting in Williamsport today, but call and schedule a strategy session. And during that meeting, we will look at your situation. Right now, me and Tammy are speaking to a good crowd of people. So we have to be pretty general, but in the room, we ask some questions beforehand. Make sure we'll look at your existing documents. We'll look at your, your estate, the way it's set up. Your, your particular family dynamics. And we'll talk about um, what your unique situation looks like and what we can do to plan ahead. At the end of the day, it's um, at the end of our time together, hopefully, you know, once we come up with a plan, we'll enact that plan. And you'll walk out of our office with a peace of mind saying, I'm glad that's behind me. And I always joke to say, now that you have it in place, it's not a race to use it. It'll be here when you need it. But most importantly, there is a plan that's there when the time comes. And then, and then after our meeting, um, anything that we didn't cover, um, we, we follow up with recommendations and we can work with you to implement that plan over, over time. And any legal documents we need to do, of course, we're going to make sure that you get the best quality that's out there. We always stay up to date with the laws as they are ever changing. And um, we will will uh, more or less hold your hand through the entire process, walk you from start to finish, and make sure that you are knowledgeable about what's going on and why we're doing what we're doing at each step. And so, um, so by joining our seminar today, that first session is going to be free. Everyone, you know, the lawyers get a bad rep. I don't understand it because I, I, I've always been an honest one, but um one of these questions is always, you know, what's what's this going to cost? Well, to sit down with us, there's no obligation on that. And uh, we would discuss any fees before we would, you would be billed for anything. And so what's, 
And so how do you book, book your uh, session? Well, there's a few different ways there. You can always go to the website. There's a general email address you can, you can um, send an email to, or you can give us a call. That 800 number can connect you to any of our offices. So depending on where you live, doesn't matter. That number will work. We'll get you to the right office and uh, we'll get you taken care of. Across, across any of our locations, um, every plan is different to the individual, but our approach is the same across the entire firm. We're looking to get a plan in place for you. Then one thing that we have just started in the last, I don't know, six months or so, is we wanted to make sure that anyone, regardless of how young or busy they are, can get access to good quality legal documents. Um, because some, uh, there's not many good legal documents that can be found online. Yeah, I can Google last will and testament myself, but then what are you actually getting? Well, you don't know until you find out. And if you die with it, you, it's too late to do anything with it. So we, the QR code at the bottom or paeldercouncil.com slash online will will take you to a portal that will allow you to walk through the um, questionnaire to um, get all the information that we would need. And um, you can you can fill out everything you need to do wills, powers of attorney, or children's trust for young children in just a few minutes. And um, you'll still get our top quality documents and get a chance to sit down with an attorney in our office to answer any questions before you sign them. But just and that it can all be done at the convenience of your own home with one quick meeting with our office just to make sure that everything's in good shape and that you know what you're signing. So for younger people or people that are busy, this is a great opportunity to uh, save the money of of because of course it takes less time for us. We pass that on to you. It's cheaper, it's easier, it's quicker, and it, it's it's right there at your fingertips. So keep that in mind. And so. <clears throat> So remember that, you know, you'll, you'll know what options are for long-term care that are out there and how you can protect your assets. We'll make sure you get the documents you need and leave with the peace of mind, knowing that you got a plan in place. And so Kyle mentioned a lot of this, but we're here for you. Of course, we're always glad to meet with you in person, but you can hear me online if you want. We got Facebook, YouTube, podcast, whatever, whatever you, there. and me and Tammy just covered the, the surface today, but um there's a lot of different stuff out there, um, a lot of different topics that we cover. So if you're interested to hear more, feel free to check us out online and we can, um, we'll be able to make sure you can get the information that you're looking for.